Hello again. In the earlier video, we talked about very overarching principles of control materials and we classified materials as internal controls and external quality assurance material. And in this following videos, we will now first talk about internal controls and we will come to the external quality assurance in later videos. Before we start talking about internal control materials, we need to understand that internal control materials can be classified in very many ways. As per process, we already talked about it, it can be a qualitative control or a quantitative control. As for the material availability, it can be lyophilized material or ready to use material. All of us know what lyophilized material means. It means the material is available in freeze dried form which needs to be reconstituted before use. And as per source, it can be classified as commercial or in-house controls. And as per target definition, you can classify it as assayed or unassayed controls. And as per the vendor who is supplying the material, you can classify these as first party, second party or third party controls. We will examine each of these in detail. So first let us look at the as per source, commercial versus in-house controls. And here let us also combine the assayed unassayed principles into this. When you are talking about commercial controls, that means you are getting the controls from a vendor and when you say in-house you mean you are making your pool sera in-house and when the commercial controls then become be either assayed or unassayed. Assayed means the target value is predetermined and you only have to verify and use it. Whereas in the case of unassayed controls target values are not predetermined and full assay is required before you use it. One way in which you can look at controls and what are the advantages versus disadvantages of commercial controls which are assayed and unassayed? Let us look at the details. Assayed are tested by the manufacturer using multiple methods before sale and they are sold with the results of the testing and the common formats used with packages inserts which give you the mean and the standard deviation and the range. Whereas in unassayed controls, these are not tested by the manufacturer or if they are tested, they are only partially tested. Control values must be determined by the individual laboratory without having the guideline information from the insert. In some unassayed controls, they define the target but the standard deviation is not defined. So that onus is upon the laboratory to understand the standard deviation before the control is used to monitor the analytical systems. And again to go back to the assayed controls, these will be more expensive than unassayed controls and these are used to evaluate accuracy and precision. Accuracy, at least shifting accuracies can be determined. Some idea of mean is already there, so you will also get some idea about the shifts or change in accuracy. And it also avoids laboratory errors when determining the control values. In unassayed, they are usually less expensive than assayed controls and used to evaluate only precision and avoids manufacturer errors in determining control values. Manufacturer also can make errors while determining values. So it, it works both ways because you may have a manufacturer defined mean and SDs which may be not correct. So it works both ways where the control numbers are concerned. We will talk about it in subsequent videos. And these are some examples of uh, controls. This control is giving you both the mean as well as the range. It's a fully assayed control. Whereas this control is giving you only the mean. It's not specifying the range. And as stated earlier, QCs are biological material, which means it is composed of all analytes that is part of the normal blood. In assayed control, some of these values are assayed by the manufacturer and published in the QC insert. As blood contains numerous analytes, not all analytes can be part of one assayed control of one single QC material. Several control materials with different sets of analytes, assayed analytes are available in the market. You have to find more information from the QC manufacturers. They give you idea about what kind of control materials are available. And second kind of 
classification that we talked about is commercial versus in-house controls. So, what are in-house controls? In-house controls are pool sera collected in the laboratory and characterized, validated for the analyte and preserved in small quantities and used in the daily monitoring of the analytical system. One example is making of the borderline positive controls in serology because it is positive controls and negative controls in qualitative systems are generally easy to come by and use, but to make a borderline control is a procedure that is uh, difficult because you need to understand where the cutoff of a certain test is and making borderline controls is a very essential part of your laboratory system in serology. The Labs for Life uh, QC soft has statistical tool which can enable you to make your own borderline positive controls and characterize it and validate it for your laboratory use. And uh, there is also an user manual along with the QC tool. So, please look into that to understand more about making borderline positive controls in your laboratory. And we are, as we already said, as per process, you can classify your materials as quantitative, semi-quantitative or qualitative. So, as per process, let us first look at quantitative controls. This the measurement of quantitative QCs produce numerical value as the end point. The quantity of the analyte is statistically analyzed for accuracy, precision, total error, etc. These are called statistical quality controls and any test with numerical values qualify for this kind of control mechanisms and we have given a few examples of biochemistry hematology cell counts, coagulation assays, all these have numerical values and can be subjected to the statistical quality assessment process. And then if you are looking at qualitative controls, when we talked about different kinds of tests, these measure the presence or absence of a substance or evaluate the cellular characteristics as morphology and you generally report it as reactive, non-reactive, positive, negative microbiology cultures, serology reports, histopathology reports are all examples of this kind of qualitative reporting and statistical methods cannot be used for monitoring and troubleshooting of such tests. Most uh, so these mechanisms of uh, quality assurance of these tests are different and these are said in a, a quality control uh, volume 2 module which is on the website. Kindly read through it to understand the quality assurance procedures that can be employed in qualitative tests. Rapid cards are also qualitative tests, and, but they have built in mechanisms of control process and all of us are very familiar with this kind of uh, rapid card test which is positive, negative and invalid test. I will not go into the details as we already know about it. And again semi quantitative tests. These are also similar to qualitative examination. QC procedures can be aligned to this kind of testing also. Urine controls are an example because the reports are given as 1 plus. You can quantify the results. The, the targets are given as 1 plus to 2 plus or 2 plus to 3 plus. So, the QC reporting is aligned to the kind of reporting where urine controls are concerned. And now, another kind of classification of controls is as per vendor. It could be a first party control, second party control or a third party control. We will understand what all these terms mean. The first party control uh, are those controls which are, they are also called dependent control material or first party control material. It is typically provided by the instrument manufacturer. Dependent control materials are often manufactured from the same raw material, same lot of raw material using the same manufacturing process and made in the same facility used to manufacture the instrument kit or method calibrators. Then second is semi dependent controls or second party controls. It is manufactured outside the quality system used to manufacture the instrument kit or method, but it is manufactured on behalf of or with the input of the instrument kit of the method manufacturer. And the third kind of control is a third party control or they are independent control material. These control material is manufactured outside the quality system used to manufacture the instrument kit or method. Its performance is independent of any design inputs from the instrument kit or method manufacturer. So, which one would be the best kind of control that you can use? 
So, this is the first party control which is the same path the control is taking the same path which the calibrator and the equipment and the reagent took. In the second party control the control is developed it is a different path from the calibrator, but the reagent path is the same the equipment path is the same. And the third party control is independent of any of the inputs from the manufacturer. To, so, therefore, this control scan often readily detect the changes in the reagents instrument function and calibration. So, the limitations of the first party and second party are they are using the common path that the manufacturer is using and in the third party controls are the by far the best detectors of errors in the analytical system and are always preferred if they are available. So, that is classification as per the vendor and there is one more way you can classify it, it is as per the stability and we already talked a little bit in the classifications earlier, it is either ready to use or lyophilized material. For ready to use material, it is generally the it is liquid medium, no reconstitution is needed usually more costly per box than the lyophilized material. It eliminates many of the handling and reconstitution errors and influences of matrix effect may be greater with the methods you use. That is a negative point where liquid stable controls are concerned. Lyophilized material on the other hand are freeze dried and needs to be reconstituted. It requires special diluents or deionized type 1 water, generally injection water is used. The material more convenient to transport because it is not liquid and it is in powder form, it can be easily be transported and it is usually less costly per box than the liquid controls. The lifelines control material frequently have shorter while open stability and may result in discarding of unused portion. Whereas, a liquid stable control is always stable up to expiry. So, there is the that hidden cost of wastage is not there in the liquid stable control may experience more while to while instability where li lyophilized controls are concerned and this increases in precision especially if improper handling and reconstitution errors occur and reconstitution is to be done with great expertise and care. Reconstitution of lyophilized material has to be done only by technicians trained to do it because every little piece of powder matters and you have to include every part of the control material, if little pieces, little powder particles may get into inside the cap and if you exclude that from your reconstitution, the values that are expected cannot be achieved. So, it is very important to reconstitute it correctly. Reconstitution is to be done at ambient temperature without losing even minute constituent particles. Proper mixing is a must after reconstitution and before aliquoting. Care should be taken that the QC aliquots made will not be used beyond the date of expiry. So, there are many things that you have to keep in mind where lyophilized material is concerned. And also while you are aliquoting, use or aliquot small volume so that small amounts can be thawed because if repeated thawing and refreezing will make the material invalid. So, you have to make it in small aliquot tube and the volumes that you may want to put into the aliquot tubes should be thought through. Keeping in mind if you are using fully automated analytical systems, all these systems will have a certain dead volume that have to be included in the concept of uh, deciding uh, how much of uh, met, uh, QC material should be aliquoted and also about if you need uh, uh, 300 microliters for your test, you have to add the dead volume to it and that should be the minimum measurement inside a aliquot tube and these things have to be thought through while you are using a lyophilized control material and decide on the appropriate volumes if we talked about it. Store at minus 10 to minus 20 degree centigrade or as specified by the manufacturer and the frozen sample should be thawed at room temperature before using before being used for assays, do not thaw refreeze the control material. Very important thing, never freeze and thaw the material repeatedly. And other things that you have to keep in mind, the pipette should be calibrated, diluent material should be deionized water, injection water or whichever is provided by the manufacturer. Instructions of the manufacturer should be followed for storage for both unopened and open vials, very important. Where do you, how do you store it before opening? 
how do you store it after opening what is the stability and the staff must be trained for the specific task so these are just a pictorial depiction of what are the things that you have to keep in mind read the insert very carefully especially with regard to storage and reconstitution in instructions look at the expiry date understand the conditions of storage how do you store it your paper should be calibrated and you should have the alico tubes the volume inside the alico tube must be thought through while you are storing and you use only the prescribed kind of water injection water is the best for the reconstitution and also training of your technician is extremely important in how to reconstitute the quality control material this is important whether it is internal control or external control as long as you are reconstituting lifeless material every caution should be taken and the operator should be thoroughly trained for the same and when you are talking about liquid liquid stable controls you don't need you don't have to worry about all those reconstitution requirements you just follow the date of expiry requirement which is shown on the label and if you are using hematology controls uh, in cap piercing uh, and cap opening mechanisms are available in most of the automated hematology analyzers so you should understand the number of times the manufacturer is allowing you to open the cap if you are opening the if you are using the cap opening uh, the mechanism for your controls how many cap piercings are allowed how many times the opening and closing is allowed all those things should be understood uh, from the manufacturer while you are using these otherwise you will find un desirable and unacceptable amount of imprecision and it's all because you haven't preserved your material well it is your defect of your qc and not your an alkyl system when i'm talking about both these step, uh, materials liquid stable material as well as lifeless material why the storage is so important is because if you remember the last video we said stable biological material very important the stable part is very important if your biological material is not stable how can you use that material to evaluate the stability of the analytical system so it's very important to hold your qc material stable they should be reliable therefore every instruction should be followed and the staff should be thoroughly trained to handle qc material then only the value of the qc material can be used to monitor your analytical system the fridge and freezer temperature is very important before reconstitution most of the qcs are lifeless qcs are set kept at 2 to 8 degrees after reconstitution they are stored in the freezer to so extremely important that you monitor the fridge and freezer temperature and also to have the thermometers which which monitor the fridge and freezer temperature be calibrated so you're sure about the performance of this equipment so take care to store the control material carefully as per the manufacturer's instructions i'm reiterating remember only stable qcs are useful to detect instabilities in the analytical system and one more thing about qc material is you're purchasing the qc material what are the thoughts that you would want to put in i know it is not entirely up to the laboratory to decide on what qcs you get but you do have a say and you should have the understanding of good quality control materials therefore please understand and read through literature which gives you ideas about how to purchase quality material quality control material and a few of these concepts are explained here first one is the matrix what is a matrix matrix is a the material in which all your analytes are suspended so qc matrix should be like the patient material patient like material if it is a serum then the matrix should be like human serum if it's a urine control it should be like urine if it's a spinal fluid control it should be like a spinal fluid it, and if it's a whole blood it's the matrix should be like whole blood so all those matrix is a very important thing and you should read through the qc literature to understand what the matrix is second is again the relevant clinical decision levels QC values should be able to monitor normal low and high levels of analytes that you are examining many controls like hematology controls immunoassay controls have three levels low high and normal some routine chemistries have only high and low controls so whatever are the clinical decision levels those levels should be monitored by the controls 
Therefore, look at the options available whenever you are purchasing a control. Look at the clinical decision options available in the control. Third is very important again, lot stability. It's ideal to have QCs which have longer periods of stability. This is not a possibility in hematology controls because most of the hematology controls have only very low shelf life whereas uh, biochemistry controls have pretty long stability and so to continue with the same lot is an advantage and the vendor also should be able to supply you with the same lot as much as possible. That is one more thing that you need to get assurance from the vendor before you select a vendor to provide you the QC material. And Availability of Interval Laboratory Comparison Programs, we talked about this in the first video. The peer group data is a very important parameter that you can use to understand the your shifting accuracies, inaccuracies. Therefore, the, if there is inter laboratory comparison available with your in, internal control provider, it is a great advantage and you should make it a point that such programs are made available to your laboratory. This is something that you have to work into the contract when you are deciding on a QC provider. And the cost effectiveness of course goes without saying and uh, that also has to be assured while you are purchasing your internal control material. So this is one just a pictorial, pictorial depiction. You are looking at the money part of it, inter laboratory comparison part, clinical decision level, long expiries that should be available and matrix. All of them are equally important. And all these factors should be kept in mind while you are buying your QCs, while you are selecting your QC provider. Thank you very much.